Okay, so we can also use urine bil bilirubin to give us a feel for what's going on. Uh, and the dog, they have a low renal threshold, so they can normally have a trace of urine of bilirubin in their urine no matter what. But if you see increase on the dipstick with bilirubin from other species, or if it's elevated above the trace of one plus in the dog, that tells you have way too much conjugate bilirubin in the blood. So that tells you you most likely have a cholestatic problem going on, or you may have so much in breakdown of red cells that you're, you're getting a lot more of that bilirubin in there. Okay? But again, in dogs, it's normal to have a trace to one plus. Right. Now, as far as urobilinogen is concerned, remember we said a little bit of that is reabsorbed from the gut, and it will go out to the dog urine very readily, so they normally can have a trace of urobilinogen, but you cannot use the absence of urobilinogen on a sample to tell you that they have cholestasis, because it's such a low level, that you know, but if it's consistently like that over a period of, of a week or so, then it can indicate that you have cholestatic mechanisms, but then there are quicker ways to do that, like looking at the GGT and stuff like that, as far as the blood is concerned. However, if we've got an animal that has uh, increased the urobilinogen in the blood, again, that tells you you've got more conjugated going down to the gut, more conjugated in the gut being converted to urobilinogen, etc. So that generally means that you have an increase in the beginning step, which is the breakdown of your red blood cells, is causing this increase in bilirubin all the way through the, through the thing here. Okay. So uh, again, the absence not going to tell you much, but if you have increase, that's where we get an interpretation. All right. So those were the indicators for. <coughs> pardon me. Cholestasis. Now the last one is loss of functional hepatic mass. Now, does the liver do a bunch of stuff necessary for normal metabolism? So can you really get a bunch of problems if it's not up there that's working properly? All right, so as far as one of the major ones we use now are bile acids. Where do bile acids come from? Don't tell me bile. Where do bile acids come from? The liver makes them, puts them in the bile, okay? And they're made from your triglycerides and things as a backbone of liver takes it, converts it into bile acids, and it stores a bunch of them. Now, the major storage space place in the small animal, of course, is the gallbladder, and also cows and stuff. Where are they stored in horses? No, they're stored in the large bile ducts. You don't get a constant flow of stuff out of the bile in the horse. What it is, they're stored and you get a small dribble. But, Bile ducts with walls will expand and you'll be like a gall butter, but not quite sealed off as well. Okay? And so they are stored there. Then uh, what happens when the animals, the food starts to move from the stomach into the small intestine? What gets released? Well, how? Goes this to kinder. And that constricts the bile, bile ducts and stuff. And that pushes the bile acids down. Okay? What do they do when they get to the proximal duodenum? They emulsify fat. So that lipase from the pancreas can break them down. Then what happens to the bile acids? They're reabsorbed in the ileum. They get into the portal vein. And when the portal vein gets to the liver, what happens to the bile acids? The liver pulls almost 100% first pass of fat. Because they're kind of toxic and you know, they, they emulsify fat, and so what's that going to do to cell membranes if you have so much of it? It breaks them down. And so basically, it wants to conserve and recycle. So, as far as your, uh, excuse me, bioessences are concerned, they are one of the most sensitive ways to detect liver problem, function problems. Okay? Because most of the time, remember with the kidney things, you had to have 75% of the kidney damage before you saw much differences? A little bit about the same way. But your bile acids will usually pick up when you've got damage. If they're elevated in the blood, it will usually detect it when you maybe have about, that little less than 60% damage. Okay, so it's a little earlier detection. Okay? Now, as far as your uh, bile acids, what else can elevate them? Let's look at this. 
principal cause of increased bile acids are uh, basically those congenital and acquired insufficiency in cholestasis. What's one of the major uh, inherited uh, liver problems? Oral systemic shunt. Because if you're taking the main blood supply from the liver, what happens to the liver? You get fibrosis and all this type of thing. Okay? It's still producing bile acids. If the liver is not producing bile acids, the animal is dead. Okay? But it's producing them. It is uh, putting them out there. But uh, if you've got uh, you know, basically liver insufficiency, they're stored out there. The animals fed, go down to the small intestines, they reabsorb, but what about the number of cells there that can pull those bile acids back out of the blood on that first pass effect? Greatly diminished. So your postprandial bile acids are going to be markedly elevated with hepatic insufficiency. Okay? Now what about cholestasis? Are they going to be sitting in the bile ducts? Can they get down to the gut? So when you feed the animal, are you going to see much of a difference after you feed the animal? No, but if they're sitting in that bile duct, are they going to erode the membranes and get high levels in the blood from that? So what we're saying is when you do a bile acid exam, you do a resting or preprandial level. What's prandial mean? E. Some of you are doing now, we'll do it in a minute, in a little while, right? Preprandial resting level, and then you feed the animal, and you take blood samples, depends on your protocol, maybe 20 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever, up to a couple hours after you fed the animal and measure your bile acids. So in a normal animal, you feed the animal, the preperennial levels are going to be low, usually less than 10 <coughs> micromoles. When you feed the animal and take the sample, the first sample would be about 45 micromoles and then it'll go down from there. Okay. <laughs> what if I take a bile acids on my, rep, my, uh, rep, my resting bile acids? And they are 220. That bit above normal. I feed the animal, and they go to 222. What does that tell me? It didn't happen. The bile acids were in the duct, right? Did they get released down to the? Well, so that tells you you have always taste. Okay. The reason your blood levels are high is because, again, they break down lipids and membranes, they're trapped in the biliary system, they leak into the blood. Okay. Now, what if, on the other hand, let's say my resting bile acids were 120, which is still really elevated, isn't it? I feed the animal and they go to 340. Did they get released? Yeah, they got down there. Because postprandial, they wouldn't have increased if they had, right? <coughs> they got reabsorbed, but what was the liver unable to do? Pull them out. In other words, your highest resting levels with little change postperennially is most indicative of cholestasis. Okay? Your highest postperennial levels are most indicative of hepatic insufficiency. Okay? The reason the lefting, resting level may have been high is because were they able to reabsorb the bile acids that got released the first time when the animal ate a while back. In other words, the higher the resting level with a marked increase postperennially, the more severe the hepatic insufficiency is. You all with me on that? And that's how we interpret the bile acids. They have been validated as far as cats, dogs, and horses, but the cow, again, doesn't cooperate very well, so we have to be careful when we use them in horses. Okay. And that is a very uh, safe way of evaluating hepatic function. And basically, we've already done this in here. You can see what the resting normal values are, this type of thing. See the problem with the cat? They're high to begin with, <laughs> so it's hard to interpret when you have increased levels, okay? Now, already gone through this. Anybody any questions on the cholestasis and how to interpret it as far as biases are concerned? The lack of functional mass. Any problems? So what if an animal had very, very high total bilirubin, very, very high conjugate bilirubin, my bowel acids were way above normal. What would be your first diagnosis? Cholestasis. Okay. What if my bilirubin was high, but it was predominantly unconjugated bilirubin? 
My biases were relatively high, but when I fed the animal, they went sky high. What does that tell me? That's functional. The reason the bilirubin is high because are you still breaking down red blood cells? But what is the liver unable to do? Take it up and convert it. Okay? And so basically you want to see that. Okay. Alright. Now, now they said that's a safe test. What's the most sensitive test for liver function? Anybody? A blood ammonia test. Why would ammonia tell you anything about liver function? Ammonia come from? It comes down from the metabolism of amino acids, it's the amine group. Okay, and what's supposed to happen to that amine group? It's supposed to be converted to what? Urea. Urea by what? The urea cycle in the liver, right? So if the liver is non functional, what's going to happen to blood ammonia levels? It's already up. So the most sensitive, specific test for liver function is the ammonia tolerance test. Where you give the animal ammonia chloride and you should, you, mon you monitor the blood ammonia levels. And they'll increase significant. So why, and it will detect liver function deficiencies of about 50% or less. So it's much more sensitive. But why don't we use that instead of bioacids? What's one of the problems with giving an animal that has liver insufficiency ammonia? Where's it going to go? Liver can't take it up, right? Well, man, I got liver insufficiency. Then you also have dead animal disease if you're not careful. Because where's all that ammonia going to go? The brain causes what? Hepatic encephalopathy, which can be manifested how? Convulsions, seizures, blindness, and lack of longevity. <laughs> Okay. So even though it's one of the most sensitive tests, it is the most dangerous one to use. And that's why the bioassist test was developed. I may have mentioned it before, but my fellow graduate student at Cornell is the one who developed and uh, verified the bioassist test for veterinary medicine. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, this is showing you how that works as far as it does in here. Liver is supposed to take 85% up, that 15% is negligible, can be used to make other amino acids and stuff. And what happens if you cut out that 85% there? Where's 100% going to go? All over the tissue body, and it's going to go right through the blood brain barrier. What's it do when it gets into the brain? Anybody? It inhibits energy production by the neurons. It inhibits the production of neurotransmitters. It causes swelling of the astrocytes, which form a barrier between the blood supply and the neuron. So if you get that big astrocyte, what's that going to do to the amount of nutrients and oxygen to get through to the neurons? Cuts it out. Okay, so it basically wipes out the brain. Okay. All right, now. Basically, as far as your blood ammonia, as you say, less than 60% loss will cause its elevations. And so, you know, that basically is very, very sensitive. But what's the problem with a lot of things which are very, very sensitive and very good to use? What's one of the problems with them? They're also dangerous. Okay, and so that's one of the problems we have with this. Okay. And yeah, we basically talked about this already, what it did. All right. I'm read these things. Y'all can read these things in the PowerPoints. I don't want to bring them back to you, right? We just talked about them, right? Okay, now you can also use some foreign dyes. What's one of the problems with foreign? Because they are foreign, right? <laughs> so, there are a couple of dyes. In other words, you give these animals these uh, dye compounds, usually IV, and the liver is supposed to clear them very quickly. So you measure the blood levels after you get it, and if the liver's working, what should happen to those blood levels? They should drop. Once they stay up, what does that tell you the liver is not doing? It's not taking them and converting them. Okay? Well, the problems with that is, is that they have to get to the liver to be excreted, right? What if they have circulatory problems? Could that slow down their getting to the liver? So could that say, well, i got a liver problem you may not have? Also, some of the dyes have to be bound to the albumin to slow down their excretion. Where's most of the blood albumin come from? 
the liver. If you have titanium insufficiency, what are your albumin levels going to be? Low. So that then that free dye, even though it's not going out as fast as you'd like it to, it goes out faster because it's not being bound to the albumin, so that can mask a problem with the liver. You all with me on that? And uh, one thing also, you've got to be very careful with some of these dyes. If they don't come out as liver like they're supposed to, they'd be toxic. Bromocethaline or BSP is one. That's the one that's bound to albumin, and the albumin dissociates from it, gets uptake by the hepatocytes, and goes out to the excretory system. And approximately 55% of the functional mass of the liver is lost before you get reduced BSP clearance. So it's a little bit better than a lot of other tests. But again, there's too many things which can influence it. Now, BSP, I used to have to do that thing all the time before. Now, BSP is a beautiful color, too. It's kind of a, you know, light pinkish color, so it's pretty. Okay? So you may, but you can't get automated instruments with it. You've got to use a bench spectrophotometer to do the stuff. Okay? Now, one of the problems as far as BSP is concerned, as we say, is that levels of albumin will affect it. Also, Circular thermal problems will affect it. So things other than liver will cause problems with it. Okay. Now, as far as doing this test, this is only in here for your information. I'm not going to ask you how you run a test because you can go and look it up, right? So why clutter your brain with memory about how to do that, all right? But you need to know what the dye is used for and what its drawbacks are. Okay, and what its advantages might be. Okay, so if you look at this, the uh, normal half-life, in other words, the normal amount stays in the uh, blood for a horse is about 2.8 plus or minus five minutes. So you can see that goes through very quickly. Okay, as far as some of your other animals, it's uh, you know, usually we do what we call a retention test, and you go after about 30 minutes, you may have about. 5% or less of that BSP still in the blood. Whereas in large animals, we use the clearance test on the T1 half and stuff. Another dye is rose bengal, which is used very often in human medicine. You can also use it as far as animals are concerned. It's almost identical in the use as the BSP is. Another one is endocyanide green. It's used uh, mainly again in veterinary medicine. I mean, excuse me, in human medicine, but we can also use it. My biggest criticism of uh, uh, IGCG is that it's, you know, that the cap on a heparin tube is ugly green, right? This stuff's uglier than that green. Okay, it's not as fun to deal with. But again, interpretation is similar to BSP. The one that we, we used to use BSP a whole lot before we developed bioacids as far as assay. Okay, proteins. What's the uh, major source of albumin? <coughs> it's the liver, right? But is that the only thing that will cause low albumin levels? How about protein losing nephropathy? Or protein losing enteropathy? So in other words, it's not that specific. But if you have that in combination with other problems, it can lead you to say, yeah, that looks like I've got a liver function problem. Maybe we better go do some bioacids to make sure. Okay. Uh, blood uric acid, uh, you know, what's purine? I mean, it has an in it. All right, and basically the end product is uric acid. Now, in mammals other than primates, that uric acid is converted to allotonin, and then that happens in the liver. And then allotonin is really broken down. If I have liver function problems, what will happen to my blood levels of uric acid? going to increase. Now what breed of dog can't we use this test in? Dalmatians. The Dalmatians because you know that uric acid usually if it elevates in the blood it's going to go out into the urine. So we're going to see increase in uric acid crystals and if we got excessive blood urea levels? Ure, I mean blood, blood uric acid levels? Right. But those are normal as far as your Dalmatians are concerned. Also some of the couple of the dogs. Okay. So uh, Again, we can use that and look at the urine and see the uric acid crystals, which you all might see later on today. Uh, but anyway, all right, so uh, 
again, these are other tests where some of them you've got some just kind of gray areas on your other tests. Then you can do some of these other more expensive tests or not quite, you know, definitive tests to give you a hand on this, okay? And uh, horse prothrombin and fibrinogen are all over. Why, why would you measure those as an indication of liver function problem? Liver makes a lot of them. Liver makes a lot of them. So what would be one of the earliest indicators of liver disease in the horse? Well, liver function problem in the horse. Hmm? No, when well, you're going to look at your PT. What's wrong with time? Let's go to the long one. It's a little easier to measure than the fibrinogen. Plus, one problem, the horse makes a lot of fibrinogen. But if you don't have the coagulation factors to go down and activate fibrinogen, what's your time going to be? For long. So you look at your PT because it's a little easier to run than the APTT. Remember, in other animals, your hypoglycemia is one of the earliest signs. That doesn't work in the horse, right? So we can use the prothrombin time to help us out. You can use APTT if you want. Prothrombin time works fine. Okay, so everybody clear on the differences that we look at as far as leakage, cholestasis, and lack of functional hepatic mass. Alright, now if we have lack of functional hepatic mass because we have a, a very severe active cirrhotic process going on, can we have all those three things going on? Yes. But does having cirrhosis mean you're going to have all them going on? Because remember it's not a like that, it's a cyclic problem. In between the cycles, it's going to look perfectly normal. And then you get active fibrosis again and you can see the changes. Okay?